well, it's not like it used to be. You know? <laughs> We are living in interglacial times. For the last 15,000 years, we've been living in a period called the Holocene. The previous interglacial period was between 130 and 116,000 years ago. Between the two, we have this vast ice age in which humanity evolved. Glaciers covered much of the world, but starting 15,000 years ago, temperatures began to climb. Civilization and all of recorded history occurred in this warm period the long summer of the human species. How do we know this? We've got deep sea cores that show the changes throughout time for thousands of years. We have ice cores such as the ones from Greenland. We have tree rings and their variants and of course we have human historical records particularly from when you know, literacy came about. And from all of these records we discover how hunters in southwestern Asia took up farming when a 1,000 year cold snap brought drought that ended just as rapidly as it had begun. A thousand year chill led people in the Near East to take up cultivation of plant foods. Depending on who you believe, this may have come about in ancient Jericho. They were intensive gatherers and traders and they built defensive walls. Because the wheat seeds archaeologists have found vary so much in size, it suggests that cultivation was very new if indeed it had begun here by 8500 BC. From 13,000 BC to 8000 BC, Europe became covered in forest thanks to warming climates and retreating glaciers. This climatic change and resulting alteration in the ecology of the region led to the extinction of the large and medium-sized herd animals that were the favoured prey of Cro-Magnons, our early ancestors, such as the mammoth, the woolly rhinoceros, the giant deer, and the reindeer, and their replacement by generally smaller dispersed game like red deer, wild boar, etc. Not only did this change in <coughs> excuse me, fauna lead to a change in hunting technologies, it also led to an increased reliance on plant food and in general much broader diet that included nuts, seeds, tubers, fruit and fungi. Other changes included increasing mobility, increased mobility, and the end of cave art as tribes and bands were no longer attracted to certain areas and the development of course of the bow and arrow and much much more. So immediately we see technology is driven by incentive, incentives like climate change. Um, people had to change because their old ways were no longer effective in dense forest against solitary skittish prey. Jumping ahead to 6000 BC, the settlement of Mesopotamia, agricultural dependent, agriculture dependent on seasonal rainfalls. So they were very concerned about rainfall and basically had to adapt depending on the rainfall. They couldn't, at this point, become irrigation farmers. That happened around about 5000 BC. The world's first irrigation farmers, the first literate citizens, the cities, urbanization, and a huge population growth there in Mesopotamia. We discover <clears throat> how centuries of much drier climate helped found cities in Mesopotamia and brought cattle, cattle herders to the gates of ancient Egypt and eventually nearly toppled the pharaohs. Talking about the city of Ur in what is now modern day Iraq. Once a great city and one of the world's earliest civilizations it thrived thanks to the abundant rainfall and then suffered, suffered even more severely when the Indian Ocean monsoons shifted southward, changing rain patterns. By 2000 BC, its agricultural economy had collapsed, and today it is an abandoned landscape, an assemblage of decaying shrines in the harshest of deserts. Now, our author Fagan views this event as pivotal. It was the first time, he says, an entire city disintegrated in the face of environmental catastrophe. Um, 1200 BC to 300 BC, the wealth of Greece, Sicily and Carthage rose to great heights in these years, starting from being near zero. This is a time of warming. Crete, of course, was long since up and running, but we talk about the Minoan Warm Period. lasted about 200 years, hit us around about 375 BC, and also the Roman Warm Period of 
450 AD approximately, which, well, 250 to 450 AD, let's say. That's what it says here, and I don't really need to tell you about the Greeks and the Romans, do I, and how much they achieved for art and science and literature. I think that's pretty well known. We move along now after that Minoan warm period to the Dark Ages. These were cool times and I don't think there's much necessity to go over what the Dark Ages were like either. They were cold and not a lot of civilization going, at least in our part of the world. In the West, people were losing the impulse to make durable habitation, so you're not going to find much remaining architecture or sites from those many hundreds of years. The pagan tribes preferred drifting, taking their animals and possessions with them. And that lasted a long time. Coming up and uh, then to the medieval warm period, which is approximately 900 to 1300 AD, the world warms again. Half a millennium ago, the Earth experienced a rise in surface temperature that changed climate worldwide, a preview of today's global warming. In some areas, including Western Europe, longer summers brought bountiful harvests and population growth that led to cultural flowering. In the Arctic, Inuit and Norse sailors, i.e. Vikings, made cultural connections across thousands of miles as they traded precious iron goods. Polynesian sailors riding new wind patterns were able to settle the remotest islands on Earth. But, in many parts of the world, the warm centres brought drought and famine. Elaborate societies in Western and Central America collapsed, and the vast building complexes of Mayan cities were left empty. Cereal crops were grown in Norway, Iceland. Wine was grown in England, and in fact exported to France. Prolonged droughts to much of the Americas, however, these people's, people, peoples reacted to the drought by relocating entire communities. Mayan rulers created huge water storage facilities, but their civilization partially collapsed under the stress of repeated multi-year droughts, while the Chumu lords of the coastal Peru adapted with sophisticated irrigation works. Lovely theme there of adaptation versus rationing, although you know the Mayas took a shot at it, but they were not able to save themselves as the Peruvians were. Now I'm a little bit short on images when it comes to Mayans and Peruvians, so I've had to improvise with a bit of Indiana Jones here on your screen. Now, as I say, England was exporting wine to France. The vineyards also flourished in impossible, or at least improbable, regions like southern Norway and eastern Prussia. During the medieval warm period, around or shortly before 1200 AD, 1200 AD evidence suggests that the Vikings colonised Greenland. That was the time. They appear to have abandoned Iceland and Greenland about 1400 AD as global temperatures fell, which makes good sense. Um, we also have in this time the cathedral building, thanks to the surplus in the warm and if you like Pillars of the Earth, which is Ken Foliot's book, then you're going to love the cathedrals. Um, elsewhere, Mongolia, northern China, these areas generally became drier. The Tang Dynasty fell by the early 900s as crops failed. And there's Genghis Khan. His bloody rampage across the Asian continent happened in no small part because the grasslands of the Mongolian steeps grew too parched for his people to graze their horses there. Although data remains sketchy, it seems probable that extended droughts dried up past pasture land on the Central Asian steppe, propelling the armies of Genghis Khan westward. Genghis Khan hit the saddle in the early 1200s and conquered a good part of the Asian landmass from northern China to Russia and even as far as Poland. And now things cool down again. We've got a period called the Little Ice Age, which we're coming out of in our modern times, but here's what we know about the Little Ice Age, was the collapse of those Norse settlements in Greenland. Um, we saw the Irish famine, we saw the French Revolution, although that's drawing a long bow for me, because I'm not in a big hurry to explain all of history through climate, but it does have some tantalizing connections, doesn't it? French Revolution, not so sure. English and Dutch farmers diversified their crops. They became much less vulnerable to bad weather. The unexpected benefit of the Little Ice Age? Uh, the English enjoyed centuries of white Christmases, leading to a whole catalogue of Christmas carols about snowy English countryside. Had it looked like the waterlogged scenes of rural England in January today, would we ever 
have had jingle bells as a song in our culture. So if that's a benefit for you, if you think that all those years of being having your ass frozen off are uh, worth it in return for jingle bells, well, big cost, small benefit perhaps, then the Little Ice Age, okay, so we've started that in the early 1300s, and it came up to that late 1800s, or no, let's say the early 1800s is when the Little Ice Age started to end. Um, helped along by the arrival of the Black Death during that time in the 1300s, and the large drop in crop harvests, the population of Europe crashed and took about 300 years or more to recover since the 1300s. The Norse populations of Greenland, as I say, they died out altogether by 1450. From around 1650 to 1820, the River Thames froze over. The freezing of the river was celebrated with a winter carnival. Now that doesn't happen anymore, because we are in a warm period. But back then, the Little Ice Age happened quite regularly. People had markets out on the river. And one of these years, maybe several, there was no summer. And Mary Shelley stayed indoors, sharing ghost stories writing the book Frankenstein, which I've read and it ain't half bad. And then of course we have this modern warm period which we've come to now and as far as I know posterity has yet to give a name to it. So to conclude my presentation, two main points. Number one, global warming is history. It happened before and that's perfectly usual. Please don't go into your thinking about climate change supposing it is new and unprecedented. It's really not. Second point, global warming makes history. Human adaptations to climate have made us who we are today. Our cultural and technological evolution hasn't come off too badly from the fray of warmings and coolings. There will be winners and losers as always, but far more winners if we put our adaptability front and centre rather than, say, an Earth Hour type rationing and reduced consumption approach to the challenge. I'm done. Uh, on the next show, how does a free market economy deal with natural disasters, or indeed unnatural disasters, such as climate change. See you then.